welcome to those that are on the line for our second meeting of this committee. We'll give folks another couple of minutes to hop on, uh, and then we'll get underway with some housekeeping items and introductions of the committee members. So we'll get maybe a, a, another one to two minutes to hop on. We appreciate your patience. All right. As people are continuing to join, I'm going to just uh, review a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, these should be fairly standard from meeting to meeting, but are still uh, important for me to go through. So uh, we'll do that, and then we'll uh, I'll turn it over to Tom, and we can do some committee introductions. Uh, first, I just want to note that this is a public open session, so um, anybody is welcome to join this meeting. And we will be recording it, uh, and uh, it does take a little bit of time, but shortly after our meetings, we do intend to post the uh, video recordings on our website as well. We ask that folks remain muted when not called upon to speak, and we will use the raise hand feature, uh, which is in the reactions tab, in order to moderate the conversation. I do not anticipate it being an issue at all for today's uh, conversation, but just to note that as a general rule, we aim to prioritize the questions uh, and the information gathering efforts of the committee members and allowing questions and comments from uh, others on the line as time permits. Um, I should say we prioritize committee members and invited guests uh, and then allow for a more open discussion uh, if and as time allows. So. Um, I think those are the, the primary things that I wanted to just review today. Uh, if you have any technological questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to my colleague, Eric Yanisko, who's on the line, um, and he can assist with any uh, of the sort of more IT or logistical oriented questions. And if you have any uh, content questions um, or questions about the agendas, uh, meetings going forward, you're welcome to reach out to me or my colleague, Leanne, who is also on the line. Uh, with that, Tom, I think I will kick it over to you um, and we can get our committee introductions underway. Thank you, Stacey. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Miller. I serve as chair of this committee, which is uh, in, tasked with conducting a consensus study, assessing equity in the distribution of fishery management benefits uh, with a particular focus on data and information availability. This study is sponsored by the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Office of Sustainable Fisheries, and they deserve considerable credit for uh, bringing this topic to the academies um, for uh, advice and in, in, in input. Um, this is our second meeting. Um, and so in this meeting, we're going to reflect on um, some of the questions that the committee had after our first me meeting, which um, I found to be um, really informative uh, and helped me begin my thinking about this process. So we're going to go around and introduce all of the committee mem members so people know who they are. Um, I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Tom Miller. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science at the Chesapeake Biological Lab, which is about 50 miles south and east of DC. I'm a fisheries ecologist uh, by training. Um, I serve on the Mid-Atlantic um, Scientific and Statistical Committee 
I also do work for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. Um, and I serve on the National Academy's Ocean Studies Board and the UN, uh, US Committee for the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. <laughs> Long title. Um, uh, and so we'll go around in alphabetical order. So I think next on that list then is Rachel, Rachel Donkerslut. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Rachel Donkerslut. My disciplinary background is anthropology. I, I call myself a social scientist and I do a lot of work in rural and Alaska native communities. Um, here in Alaska, I have roots in the Bristol Bay region and currently live in the Kuskokwim region, but um, a lot of my current work focuses on if and how to effectively and appropriately measure uh, various dimensions of well-being and equity is a component of that work. Um, um, I, I manage my own research and consulting firm, so um, I work with a variety of tribes, local governments, um, university faculty um, in both research and more applied and policy realms. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Kaylin, I think you're next. Kaylin Kreutz. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm a professor at Arizona State University in the School of Sustainability. I am trained as an economist and uh, I currently serve on the Scientific and Statistical Council for the North Pacific, uh, Scientific and Statistical Committee for the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Thank you, Kellen. Um, Grant, I think you're next. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Grant Murray, I'm marine social scientist, anthropology and sociology is my background. Um, currently a faculty member here at the Duke Marine Lab on um, Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, I'm interested in how communities work, how fishing communities work, their interactions with the environment, particular emphasis on values and different kinds of values, evaluation, uh, beliefs and attitudes and our understandings of, of how systems work and how they impact us. Um, done that work uh, here in the U.S., both coast of Canada and a little bit uh, internationally as well. Thank you, Grant. Uh, Matt Reimer, I think you're next. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. I'm Matt Reimer. I'm a professor at UC Davis in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. Um, I'm an economist by training. A, a lot of my research focuses on fisheries related issues, particularly within the US. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time on uh, various science and statistical committees, uh, both for the North Pacific and for currently the, the Pacific Council. Uh, and so I'm uh, looking forward to participating. This is obviously a really important and interesting topic. So um, nice to see everyone. Thank you, Matt. Um, Jim, I think you're next. Jim Sanchirico. Sure, sure. So hi, I'm Jim Sanchirico. I'm Professor of Environmental Science and Policy at the University of California, Davis. I am a natural resource economist who works at the interface of economics, ecology, and policy. I also serve on the Ocean Studies Board and the U.S. Committee for the UN Decade, and I'm also uh, the chair of the New Standing Committee for BOEM and the Academy on Offshore Wind and Fisheries. Thank you, Jim. Stephen, Stephen Skyfers. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Skyfers. I am an associate professor at the University of South Alabama uh, in the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Uh, my background is at the interface of ecology and sociology, and we do a lot of work with human dimensions of fisheries in my lab. Uh, I serve on the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council's uh, SSC and their Ecosystem Technical Committee, and I'm also currently serving on the, the National Academy Standing Committee on Wind, Energy, and Fisheries. Good to see you all today. Thank you, Stephen. Rashid. Yeah, so um, I'm Rashid Smaila. I'm a university Killam professor and Canada research chair in interdisciplinary oceans and fisheries economics. That's a very long one. I put the interdisciplinary very deliberately just to, to kind of signal to, to colleagues and everybody that I 
and work at different scales, local, national, global. I work with colleagues from all disciplines. I, I, I really enjoy working with non-economists and economists alike because the problem of the ocean, I think is something that we can tackle only if we think in, in an interdisciplinary way. We co-create, we co-manage, we work together, bring everybody on board in order to really try to tackle and ensure a sustainable ocean, sustainable fish rates for current fishes, but also the future ones. So that's where I stand and I'm happy to be here to work with all of you. Thank you, Rashid. Um, I'll note that Lisa Campbell uh, is also part of this committee, but cannot make uh, the meeting today. Um, Lisa is on the faculty at the Duke Marine Lab, um, where she uh, works at the interface of um, sort of anthropology and, and geography, looking at um, uh, a range of different issues related to science. And she also serves on the Ocean Studies Board with Jim and I. Um, Stacey, I would like you to introduce yourself and then introduce the staff, please. Absolutely, thank you, Tom. Stacey Karras, I'm a senior program officer at the National Academies. I've been serving uh, in that role with the Ocean Studies. Well, I've been serving uh, the Ocean Studies Board since 2012. I've been a senior program officer for probably the last uh, four or five years now. And um, background was in marine affairs and fisheries from the University of Miami, uh, followed by a law degree from the University of Virginia. And uh, while my work in undergraduate and graduate school was focused largely on uh, fisheries related issues, uh, at the National Academies were largely expected to be generalist. So I've had the opportunity to work on a, a variety of topics, um, everything from wetland restoration to oil spill response. Uh, but anytime I have the opportunity to work on a fisheries related study, it is a, a special treat for me. And I'm really looking forward to serving as the study director for this, this committee going forward. So with that, I'll turn it over to Leanne. Hi, I'm Leanne. I am a research associate on the Ocean Studies Board. Um, I'm fairly new, been here about seven months. Um, prior to that, I was at the National Science Foundation. And prior to that, I was getting my master's um, in marine biology at the University of Texas. Thank you, Eric? Leanne. Hi, everyone. Uh, Eric Ionisco. I've been with the Ocean Studies Board since October. Um, my background is more generally in environmental science, um, but most of my undergrad research has been in tropical forest ecology and remote sensing. Thank you, Eric. Um, we'll ask the speakers uh, and, and other guests who contribute to the meeting to introduce themselves as we go along. Um, I'll start by just paraphrasing our statement of task, um, which is uh, first to determine the categories of information required to oppress, to assess um, where and to whom the primary benefits of commercial and for hire management accrue. Um, and we had a lot of discussion uh, at our first meeting about trying to define primary benefits and, and how we think about where and to whom. Um, we then are asked to look at what information currently exists um, to assess that question of primary benefits um, and what additional information, if any, would NOAA be required to collect if it wished to assess um, where and to whom the primary benefits accrue, um, to identify obstacles to collecting this additional information and to identify potential methodologies that could be used to, to both qualitatively and quantitatively um, describe where and to whom the primary benefits accrue. Um, and so we've invited uh, three people from NOAA um, to come back to talk to us um, about really the first two of those parts of our statement of task. Um, 
to to ask about what information, what categories of information are available, what categories of information to to know are currently collect that would be related to assessing where and to whom the primary benefits of commercial and for hire uh, fisheries management accrue um, that will allow us then to go on and ask, well, wh where are the lacunae that we need to fill? So um, on our schedule, I don't know whether this is the order in which um, the NOAA research staff are going to come, but we have uh, Benjamin Fissell and Lisa Colburn from, from NOAA Fisheries, both I believe are attached to the Northeast Fisheries Science Center and Lindsay Fulkenkamp from, from head office at OST in Sil Silver Spring. So um, if, if whomever is gonna lead off, we invite you to introduce yourselves and, and um, let's begin the discussion. Okay. Tom, I just, I don't mean to interrupt, but I do just want to highlight, we've got a couple of other folks on the line that I know um, are not listed on the agenda, but are here in a supporting role for NOAA Fisheries. Uh, and I just want to make sure that they get <clears throat> some, um, an opportunity to, to introduce themselves along the way. I know we've got uh, Eric and Danica, Sabrina and others. So, um, you know, I'll leave it up to the speakers to um, introduce them or to integrate them in as well, but I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of some of the folks that are yep. here playing a supporting role as well. Great. Thank you. Well, so you kind of named me first, but I think Lindsay should probably be the first one to speak. Um, and uh, But I'll just introduce myself really quick. Uh, my name is Ben Fissel. I'm the Acting Chief of uh, Economics and so uh, Social Analysis Division at the Office of Science and Technology. Um, not, none of us are uh, at the Northeast Center, although uh, Lisa previously was, ah. um, as, as some others were. Uh, we're all kind of from the Office of Science and Technology, um, but it's the, um, so at any rate, I will leave it there and uh, let Lindsay speak. Thank you very much. All right. So um, today I'm going to kind of give an overview of those offices. I think many of you serve on scientific and statistical committees and might be able to explain some of this slightly better than I can. Um, but I'm going to attempt to kind of get us all on the same page on um, fisheries management kind of basics. And then <clears throat> I'm going to describe the agency, sort of how we're structured who does what, where, just to kind of give a real sort of basic overview. Um, I think Ben's gonna talk a little bit with Lisa and then we can handle questions from there. All right, I'm gonna have another slide deck and I'm gonna attempt um, to share my screen with you all. Oh, no, I can't share my screen. Eric, can you enable the screen sharing? Yeah, try now. Great, thank you. Okay, can you all see my slide? I can't see you, so how about a verbal? Yep, we can see them and they look great. Thank you, Lindsay. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're talking about NOAA fisheries and NOAA fisheries management. I'm gonna talk about the structure and functions of NOAA fisheries and then just, again, kind of level the playing field on where um, are all of our kind of understanding of fisheries management. There's three pillars of sustainable fisheries management, science to inform the management, enforcement to make sure management is working. And part of the reason I put this slide here is because the structure of NOAA fisheries, how we're organized, sort of mirrors these um, pillars, these three pillars of sustainable fisheries management. So this is our color-coded org chart. It doesn't, doesn't flow nicely on a slide, um, so we're presenting it this way. 
But up here, let's see, in the upper left-hand corner, we have our headquarters offices. There in this kind of orangey red color is the head of the NOAA Fisheries. Our assistant administrator for fisheries is Janet Coit. She has three direct reports. Sam Rauch is the deputy assistant administrator for regulatory programs in the green. Director of Scientific Programs is Cisco Warner here in the purple. Deputy Assistant Administrator for Operations right now is Jim Landon here in this kind of teal color. So we have science to inform management and the enforcement. So starting up here in the right-hand corner are our science programs. There's one science program at headquarters. That's the Office of Science and Technology. Ben is currently acting as a division chief there and his colleagues on the call today, mostly for the most part, sit in the Office of Science and Technology. We have six science centers that are located around the country. Um, and we have, that's the purple box, in the green box, we have five regional offices. Um, and in general, the locations and the um, sort of mission of each of those um, science centers kind of correspond, at least for fisheries, corresponds to um, the, the areas that the regional offices color, cover. So for regulatory programs, there's about three offices, including the Office of Sustainable Fisheries at headquarters. And then there are five regions uh, around the United States and the uh, regional administrators, including our newest for the West Coast region are listed here on this slide. Um, and then in the teal box, we have our operations division, including our um, enforcement, law, Office of Law Enforcement, but also all of our other IT and management and budget, and then some program offices, including um, international affairs and trade and commerce and those. Excuse me. So that's kind of our org chart. And here is sort of where everyone is. Um, the Southeast region here in green, and then uh, their, their sort of main headquarters, regional offices in St. Petersburg, but their main um, science center headquarters is in Miami, and then there's a number of laboratories. And that's kind of a similar structure to the way it is sort of around the country. I'm just kind of hoping no one asks me why Minnesota and Iowa and Kansas are colored here, um, but not like Indiana and Illinois, because I don't know. <laughs> but in general, this should kind of give you an idea of where we are and where we work and the, the sort of structure of the five regions and the six science centers supporting those regions. So because we have um, regionally distinct mission with regionally distinct fisheries and regionally uh, distinct issues, we have regionally distinct science. So uh, our science centers do many different things. Um, including observations, monitoring analysis. They do uh, assessments, stock assessments for fish and other protected resources. They do uh, marine ecosystems research. They do many things, but also listed here are economic and social analyses. For the most part, that's done in our science centers. Um, okay, so that's kind of the structure of the fishery service. And then I'm gonna to get to um, kind of fisheries management and we'll talk a little bit about the fisheries management councils as I go on. The Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act or the MSA as we uh, abbreviate it was adopted in 1976. It is the legislative structure and process to manage our nation's fisheries, um, our federal fisheries. And I'll talk about some of the um, differences in co-management of federal and state fisheries uh, a little bit later on. The Magnuson-Stevens Act did set up these eight regional fishery management councils. It was adopted in 1976. The primary goals of the MSA were to, um, uh, at the time in 76, to extend control of the U.S. waters to 200 nautical miles, so establish that exclusive economic zone, or the EEZ, and to phase out foreign fishing. Um, and, uh, other primary goals were to uh, conserve and manage 
fishery resources. So before the Magnuson Act, fisheries were managed by just an array of state regulations. Um, the MSA lays out 10 national standards um, that uh, have goals for balancing harvest levels um, with socioeconomic considerations. I'll go into detail on our 10 national standards on the next slide. Um, and then just kind of as a summary, um, under Magnuson, the uh, fishery service in uh, collaboration with our, our councils and our state partners and the state and interstate fisheries commissions manage 460 stocks or stock complexes in an overall 46 fishery management plans. These are 10 national standards. The Magnuson Act is guided by these 10 national standards. They are principles that must be followed in all 46 of our fishery management plans. So you can see just kind of reading through this list that councils need to balance a number of priorities, a number of often competing priorities um, as they develop fishery management plans. Um, all of these are important, um, but when we think about uh, equity considerations, there's a number here that jump out that I kind of wanted to point out. Um, the first one is National Standard 4, which is written here as no discrimination. National Standard 4 requires that to the extent that the councils need to make allocations to different entities or sectors or what, what, it, what, what it may be, um, that those allocations need to be fair and equitable that they need to be reasonably calculated to promote conservation and that they need to be carried out to avoid excessive share. So nobody gets an excessive share um, of the allocation. The other somewhat obvious one here is National Standard 8. This is um, the consideration of the importance of fishery resources to communities. And it says specifically in summary that conservation and management measures consistent with Magnuson conservation requirements must take into account the importance of fishery resources to fishing communities by using economic and social data based upon best scientific information available in order to provide for the sustained participation of those communities and to the extent practicable, minimize adverse economic impacts on such communities. Um, now, for each of our national standard guidelines, we have um, uh, uh, each of the 10 national standards, we have national standard guidelines. These are sort of our um, uh, uh, publication of the rules and our interpretation of, of the national standards. And I just also wanted to mention that in the national standard one, which uh, calls for prevention of overfishing while achieving optimum yield. Um, we say that optimum yield refers to an amount of fish which provides the greatest overall benefit to the nation, particularly with respect to food production and recreational opportunities and taking into account the protection of green ecosystems. It's prescribed on the basis of maximum sustainable yield as reduced by any relevant social, economic, or ecological factor. Okay, so before the Magnuson Act, many U.S. fisheries were in danger of collapsing. We had no kind of federal framework for managing them. Um, the passage of the MSA changed that trajectory by creating, you can see here, this exclusive economic zone. Um, beyond 200 nautical miles are the high seas, and within three nautical miles are um, the state slash coastal waters. Um, through the passage of the Magnuson Act, uh, 45 years ago, um, the U.S. was able to restrict uh, the foreign fleet access to fisheries and expand domestic access. After 76, the Magnuson Act has been reauthorized twice. First in 1996 and then in 2006. The amendments that were made in 2006 are the ones we are working under um, today, the amended Magnuson Act. Um, the, 2000, the focus of the 2006 reauthorization was to end overfishing, rebuild stocks, and it also, um, again, kind of relevant for our purposes, implemented uh, 
a section or, or kind of um, gave specific authorization for catcher programs or limited access privilege programs. Um, the 2006 reauthorization also connected, directly connected the work of the science and statistical committees to the councils because it mandated the use of these science-based ACLs, annual catch limits. You'll hear ACLs a lot. That just meant we had to have a numeric limit, annual catch limit, uh, and an accountability measure um, to better prevent overfishing. Um, so critical to the success um, of the Magnuson Act has been this kind of feedback loop. This is where I'm going to sort of go and talk about um, the councils, right? So we have this highly participatory public process through um, our regional fishery management councils, uh, whereby the councils are able to, uh, by the sort of nature of how they're made up and also the nature of the process, um, the council process through its public participation requirements, they're able to adapt and respond to changing conditions within this framework of having catch limits of preventing overfishing and rebuilding stocks. So these are the regional fishery management councils. Uh, their color coding roughly corresponds to our five regional offices. So um, the Southeast region has three councils, um, the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean and South Atlantic Council. GARFO, our Greater Atlantic Regional Office has these two councils. Um, the, our Pacific Islands region has the Western Pacific Council, the West Coast region. Um, works with the Pacific Council and our Alaska region works with the North Pacific Council. So biologically and economically and culturally, the fisheries of the United States are extraordinarily different. Uh, in the Caribbean, we've got these super biologically diverse coral reefs and they support these valuable but very small scale fisheries while up in the Bering Sea in Alaska, we've got 300 foot vessels that catch and process millions of pounds, billions of pounds of a single species um, in a year. In the Gulf of Mexico, there are over a million recreational fishermen that are mu as much a part of that region's economy um, and their culture as the commercial fleets and seafood they provide. So in order to effectively manage this sort of vast, very different um, geographic area of the, of the uh, waters of the United States, um, Magnuson established these eight regional fishery management councils. Each councils um, have voting members. Um, one of those voting members is uh, the rep a representative from NOAA Fisheries. That's the regional administrator in each of the regions. Um, and a voting member from each uh, state fishery management agency in the region, in the council region. There are also additional voting members which are nominated by state governors, um, nominated to the Secretary of Commerce. And these include commercial and recreational fishermen, environmentalists, academics, government, excuse me, scientists and others. Um, the Pacific Council also includes a designated uh, tribal seat. And each of these stakeholders um, and the sort of expertise that they represent, they bring their specific expertise um, to, the count, to the council and the council process. Um, I'm also going to touch really briefly, I, hope I'm, I don't think I'm confusing too many folks about, um, on the Atlantic coast, there are a number of species that cross boundaries. They primarily occur in state waters, but they cross the boundaries of those state waters. Um, and so those are managed um, under uh, an authority uh, that established the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Some of them are managed solely by the commission. Some of them are co-managed um, federally. In some cases, such as um, salmon in Alaska, uh, the NOAA Fishery Service has delegated the authority to manage that stock um, to the state of Alaska. One more kind of uh, little wrinkle here is the case of Atlantic highly migratory species. These include tunas, sharks, swordfish, and billfish. 
they are managed under Magnuson, um, but under the authority of the Secretary of Commerce. The Secretary of Commerce has delegated that authority to NOAA Fisheries. Um, the range of Atlantic migratory species is uh, international in the United States. It ranges from Maine through Texas and the Caribbean. And these management measures apply um, to all US flagged vessels fishing in the United States or on the high seas. This slide kind of gives you an idea of the um, geographic area and the number of fishery management plans or FMPs um, managed by uh, each of the councils. So you see we've got this sort of little slice of red, which the Mid-Atlantic um, Council covers, but they've got six fishery management plans. There's obviously a huge geographic area covered up in Alaska and in the Pacific Islands. They each have five fishery management plans. So there's a, even though their geographic area is extraordinarily broad, um, they all manage between like four and seven um, fishery management plans. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have one fishery management plan um, managed by the secretary, which is our Atlantic HMS um, fishery. And this is how it's done. This very straightforward slide here um, sort of explains it all. Um, we uh, at NOAA Fisheries rely on scientific advice um, to figure out whether, a, and to help the council figure out, figure out whether a stock, fish stock, is overfished or subject to overfishing. They, um, with the advice of our scientists, they, the Regional Fishery Management Council, set the ACLs, the Annual Catch Limits, and develop rebuilding plans. Um, and so I'll sort of walk you through this a little bit. Up here in our upper right-hand corner, we have data collection and processing that's done um, by a number of entities, but um, you know, I'd say mostly uh, by our science centers. In the case of uh, fishery stock assessment, it goes into the assessment report. Sometimes those go for full peer review, but for uh, routine update or benchmark, it goes directly to the scientific and statistical committee. They produce scientific advice and this fishing level recommendation. Um, that then, those products are provided to uh, the Fishery Management Council, but they also often go to a plan team, which is just kind of a group of experts who are going to figure out how to best take that scientific advice and that fishing level recommendation and turn it into measures um, that will be sort of enforceable, acceptable by the public, um, and, and without you know, taking all those other things into account that are um, necessary to get an effective fishery management plan in place. Um, this is also where um, the industry, the public, and any um, advisory panels that the council has, their um, information comes into play. It ends at the fishery, not ends, goes to the fishery management council, and they come up with a recommended annual catch limit. And you can see here that that annual can catch limit um, by uh, since the passage of the 2006 amendments cannot exceed um, the scientific and statistical committee's fishing level recommendation, which is based on best um, available science. After this uh, recommended annual catch limit comes out, it is sent to uh, the Secretary of Commerce. The Secretary can approve, disapprove, or partially approve um, what comes out of the council and um, the NOAA fishery service is also responsible for implementation um, of, of the council's recommendation. Here's kind of a different version of um, the steps to recommending a management measure or a summary of um, council action and issue is identified either by you know, the council themselves, the, given the expertise they have, or, you know, the public can bring an issue to the council. There are um, public meetings held, public testimony taken, uh, can be written, it can be oral. There are then required analyses done, and the council votes. Um, they adopt these fishery management measures if the um, you know, if the issue passes the, the vote through the councils, and they submit those measures to NOAA Fisheries who can then approve, disapprove, or 
partially approve the measures and implement them through regulations. And that is all I've got. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, I will look uh, briefly for a few show of hands for any clarifying questions. Uh, otherwise, we'll turn it to, to Ben and Lisa next and uh, take additional questions uh, after their presentations. But just real quickly, any initial questions for Lindsay? Again, I'll be looking for the raise hand feature. Fantastic. Well, I have a couple questions, but I'm going to save them for uh, for afterwards. Oh, Rashid raised his hand. Rashid, go ahead. Yeah, I thought it's nice to have at least one question, right? So, so uh, thank you. And my question is, given how important the management is in the U.S., this Regional Fisheries Management Council, do you think it uh, might want to structure our report around them because they are quite different, like you said, right? And, and so on. Yeah. Right, yeah, that kind of gets it like, how do we crack this nut? Um, I uh, think that recommendations made should be national in scope. Um, that's how I'm kind of feeling without person being charged with doing it. <laughs> um, uh, that I, I know, uh, and again, I don't want to get too confused with phase two of the study. Um, but I, I know that it will be difficult to kind of make recommendations that are national in scope, but I think that um, it would be more helpful uh, to us for the purposes of this study um, to take a broad look, um, but to have uh, recommendations provided to us that um, are not regional in nature, that are, are more broadly applicable um, to the entire agency. Uh, um, um, Maybe practical given the time we have and the resources, that might be the level at which this committee can operate anyway. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll turn it over then to, to Ben and Lisa. Uh, let's see, I'm not seeing the slides no it just it says you started sharing your screen but we're still seeing a black screen so maybe let's there we go now we've got it but then if you're speaking you're muted we can't hear you sorry um, well, I've already kind of introduced myself. Uh, um, I, I guess one thing I'll note is that uh, I'll speak first and then uh, Lisa and uh, Danica is actually uh, are going to are going to be speaking next. Um, and I'll let them kind of introduce myself themselves uh, after this presentation. Um, so just kind of what I'm going to cover here. Uh, Lindsay covered this quite a bit already, um, but I'll take a quick look at uh, staff and research areas just so that you kind of get a, a broad feel for where the different kind of researchers are uh, that, um, that uh, kind of deal with these data and have kind of better knowledge of them and that you might kind of need to interact with later uh, at some point kind of down the road in, in phase two. Um, uh, to kind of get a better understanding of the regional fields because there really is, I think, significant uh, differences regionally and that'll kind of crop up uh, throughout. Um, I've kind of, in terms of categories of data, uh, what I'm briefly gonna cover here on the commercial sector is permits, uh, uh, revenue data, uh, cost data, 
and then we'll talk a little bit about cat share programs. Uh, on the recreational side of things, um, you know, we're looking at uh, basically cost and earnings surveys um, and and an angler expenditure survey, and then kind of coupled with that angler expenditure survey is uh, also a durable expenditure survey that uh, that we can discuss. Uh, so just in terms of uh, economists and social scientists, this is kind of how um, we're distributed uh, across, the, uh, uh, across the science centers and, and uh, regional offices. Um, so uh, most of the science centers have uh, one or more uh, social scientists that work at, uh, that work there. Um, and uh, there are quite a number of economists also at uh, each of these kind of regional science centers. Um, so when thinking about the data, you know, you also have to think about who you kind of got to contact, uh, or at least I do if you come, uh, if you were to come to me and ask. And uh, this kind of shows you just how this is, is distributed across the nation. Uh, so, um, you know, in addition to the commercial and recreational, we also, uh, uh, you know, human dimensions uh, is another kind of research area. Um, this is uh, Lisa and Danica will sp be speaking kind of more to this human dimensions area, um, but this tends to be the focus of what we, uh, what we call the social scientists uh, that you kind of saw in the previous slide. Um, and then we also carry out uh, uh, research on uh, ecosystem services uh, as well. Um, so just some kind of broad definitions here. Uh, the commercial fish, fishing sector is really kind of uh, in a broad sense is uh, focused on operations that sell their catch for uh, profit. And so this doesn't include subsistence fishing. Um, it doesn't include uh, recreational fishing, uh, you know, uh, the for hire sector, for example. Um, this is primarily comprised of, uh, on a national level, this is primarily comprised of uh, catcher vessels, um, but it also includes things like catcher processors, vessels that catch their, uh, um, that catch both catch and process, uh, as well as motherships. Uh, motherships kind of receive uh, uh, catch from catcher vessels and then do kind of kind of onboard processing there. Uh, the recreational fishing se sector uh, is really fishing for leisure rather than to sell as a commercial uh, or in, it, you know, like in the commercial sector. Um, I guess one thing to point out here is that the recreational sector as we think of it, uh, isn't just the for hire sector, but also includes uh, private boat um, and shore sectors as well. Um, so, our definition of recreational uh, is really a little bit more broad uh, than just the for hire sector. So permits, we're going to see this theme kind of uh, reoccur throughout the presentation. The information gathered from permits uh, or on permits uh, really varies not only by region, but then uh, also by fishery. Um, and the reality is that this is basically true for much of the data that we collect and rely on, um, is that there's some degree, um, sometimes significant uh, degree of, of, of variation in these data across, uh, across the various regions. Um, this is in part uh, the result of kind of the structure uh, of uh, how fisheries are managed uh, that Lisa was, uh, or sorry, Lisa, Lindsay, apologies. Uh, Lindsay was uh, uh, mentioning before and that it's, it tends to be uh, management is more, in, is in some sense, I, not exactly bottom up, but it's a little bit more bottom up than it is kind of top down um, where, uh, uh, Councils propose measures, PACs, and stuff like this, uh, and then it's you know 
approved at uh, the national level uh, by NIMS. Um, this can be a real challenge when trying to pull together uh, national statistics for all but kind of the most basic of variables. Um, and uh, in addition, it can also be a challenge when trying to kind of merge multiple data sets, even kind of within a region. Um, some of the basic information that's kind of gathered on permits. Um, well, permits can be issued to vessels or individuals. Um, uh, they collected for open access or limited fisheries and some permits are tied, uh, capture permits are tied to allocations. Um, you know, uh, oftentimes you'll get the name and mailing address uh, for the permit, um, but the mailing address may not be necessarily the owner's residence, um, might not even be in the same state even. Uh, you know, oftentimes you'll get home port um, and the primary or hailing port uh, of the vessel, um, particularly if it's a permit issued on a vessel level. Um, sometimes you'll get things like vessel characteristics, um, and for some permits, you'll have uh, ownership and, and shareholder inter uh, interest also uh, captured as well. So on the revenue side of things, this is probably where we have the most kind of uh, regional and regionally consistent and thorough uh, data. Um, and, uh, you know, this is in large part, um, so another thing that I do is I'm kind of, I'm the lead uh, on what we call the Fisheries Economics of the U.S. report, which is the flagship uh, report for the kind of economic section of the Office of Science and Technology. But really the, the, the basis of that report is, is on uh, landings and revenues uh, for the most part. Um, in a, on the commercial side, uh, in particular. Um, and so, um, really our data for landings and revenue is, is, or can be made, uh, regionally consistent for the most basic of variables, which is volume, value, uh, vessel type, uh, gear, and kind of port. Um, reporting of these is, is, mandatory um, uh, in part because uh, it's necessary for in-season management. Um, you know, uh, sorry. Looking at my notes here, make sure. Oh, these data are publicly available in FOSS, uh, although FOSS is uh, kind of our data portal. Um, although it's highly aggregated, basically at an annual and state level. Uh, more disaggregated catches and revenues um, would in some instances be more difficult to obtain. Uh, some regions provide less aggregated data, um, but uh, the levels of aggregation might not be uniform across regions. Um, one thing that we often kind of have to deal with uh, as economists, and we're kind of uh, used to it, um, is that a lot of the kind of raw data uh, that we might rely on, for example, at the vessel or processor level, uh, is kind of oftentimes confidential. And so when sharing those, uh, when sharing uh, information, we have to, there are aggregation rules that we have to apply um, in order to kind of uh, produce and kind of publish this information in a public sense, or even share it necessarily with other researchers. Um, so this inhibits kind of the, the sharing of some kind of raw level data, um, some of which might be of interest uh, um, uh, for the later phases, um, but it's something to be aware of. Um, catch and revenue data can be combined uh, with other data sources, for example, the permit data in some instances um, if you have some kind of way of merging those. Um, volume is by far the most kind of consistent and uh, 
accurate, but there's usually enough information to kind of reconstruct revenue. Um, so just kind of two broad categories of kind of uh, uh, information that are kind of associated with this are vessel level trip reports um, and, and fish tickets, uh, sometimes also called dealer or first receiver uh, reports. Um, I'll share this uh, uh, presentation with you later, but I provided some links uh, in uh, the presentation uh, for the database and then also for some uh, uh, reports later that we discuss. Uh, in contrast, the collection of cost data is, is much less comprehensive. And here I've been able to kind of pull a slide from uh, a previously produced slide, so it's not the most recent, um, but it's still, it, I think it's still pretty accurate. Um, Coverage within a region can uh, range anywhere from 20 to 80%. Um, you can see here that we've been trying to increase our, our, our coverage of the cost data collections, uh, particularly since uh, 2001. Um, there's pretty substantial variation uh, in the types of data that are collected here, um, even within a region. And it oftentimes comes from the genesis of these uh, kind of cost data collections. Um, for example, one very large fishery might only collect uh, fuel data, um, while another in the same re region uh, might have a pretty comprehensive cost data collection. Um, sometimes these uh, 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 cost data collections are essentially kind of implemented with certain kind of management measures, uh, for example, catch shares, and so they're attached um, or they came with essentially something like a catch share program. And so the kind of era in which uh, those cost data collections came to be can in some sense uh, or in some sense uh, uh, determines the type of data that's available. Um, also, this is kind of a negotiation between uh, uh, to some degree industry um, and industry representatives on the council, um, as well as the types of information that uh, either NIMS uh, um, or uh, managers want to collect. Um, so here's a detailed tech memo uh, that I've linked to and that I believe has also been shared with the uh, committee, um, kind of outlining the, the cost data collections. Um, I've talked a little bit about uh, catch shares already. Um, we also have kind of detailed document documentation on, on uh, uh, catch shares here. Um, catch shares don't cover all of our fisheries, um, you know, but it covers and volumetrically it covers quite a bit. Uh, I can't remember the pr specific percentage of, off the top of my head, but you know. Cat shares can be issued as either IFQs or ITQs, or in some cases cooperatives, uh, or kind of a, in kind of sectors. Um, how these uh, data are kind of issued can influence the types of information that you receive about uh, transfers um, or swaps um, of 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 uh, quota. Um, for example, you might not be able to kind of observe the transfer of quota, quota within a cooperative um, if, if vessels, uh, a, a group of vessels uh, join a cooperative and then the cooperative is then issued uh, the quota share. Um, there can be differences in reporting uh, uh, for sellers and buyers. Um, there can be uh, various restrictions on uh, uh, leasing uh, kind of depending on what the fishery is specifically. Um, and in ca some cases, there are kind of quota consolidation restrictions um, that you can kind of encounter uh, with various catch share programs. So just moving kind of quickly on to the uh, recreational fisheries economics uh, data. Uh, in addition to the large commercial uh, analysis and other components of, of uh, NIMS kind of socioeconomic uh, 
analysis, uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, focus on is this recreational fishing and, and fishing effort. Um, this along with um, actually a lot of the other data are housed in, in what are called the FIN network databases, which are kind of uh, regional databases. Um, this isn't true for all the data, but it's true for uh, a significant portion of it. Um, recreational happen, fishing happens along all the nation's coastlines, but uh, um, as, as Lindsay mentioned, it's uh, most of the effort uh, or the majority of the effort uh, on a regional comparative basis happens in the Southeast US. Um, so these are kind of some of the uh, recreational uh, data collections um, uh, that we rely on. Um, you have your angler trip expenditure survey um, and I'll cover each of these, which has kind of a real revealed preference component. Um, and then uh, sometimes can roll into kind of a more targeted uh, stated preference uh, uh, survey. Um, so we also have the for hire kind of cost and earnings survey. Um, and then uh, uh, kind of almost associated with the angler trip and expenditure survey uh, or is uh, this durable expenditure surveys. Um, in addition to this, there are some one-off surveys um, that don't happen on a kind of recurring basis. But these are the basic surveys that you're gonna see on kind of a, that one might see on a recurring basis. Um, the for hire cost and earnings survey uh, is fielded to owners and operators of the for hire sector. Um, this is a regional survey that usually happens uh, approximately every 10 years and we're kind of due to uh, reissue a new survey here at some point in the future. Um, the surveys, it, it will it kind of vary, the timing of them kind of varies regionally. Um, but many of these surveys were kind of fielded in 2010 or a couple of years thereafter. Um, these are expensive surveys to field. Um, and we're kind of working with uh, OMB currently to get kind of a generic clearance, uh, PRA clearance uh, for these. Um, PRA is actually something to also kind of think about um, uh, in general. Um, you know, in a general sense, like most of the data collections that we do on people have to go through some form of PRA. Um, and so um, thinking about that when thinking about uh, also thinking about what types of data we might collect, um, uh, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, the data collected on the cost and earnings survey, vessel and owner characteristics, um, we get mostly trip based revenue, uh, trip length, this is really, this survey here is really kind of focused on, on trips. Um, there isn't much in the way of kind of demographic information on this side, uh, on this survey, um, aside from some kind of minimal characteristic, owner characteristics. Um, but um, the demographic information from this survey is, is relatively little. Um, but as I kind of mentioned, we do, however, get measures of revenues, costs, uh, species targeted. Um, and, and then another interesting kind of component of the survey is that it solicits kind of perceptions of uh, regulations and, and uh, economic conditions. So whereas the uh, for hire uh, survey was focused on uh, the vessel owners and, and companies, uh, this survey, the angler expenditure survey focuses on anglers. Um, you know, 
And what this is really trying to, what this survey in particular is really trying to get at is recreational fishing related expenditures from the anglers themselves. Um, this survey is fielded approximately every three to five years. And here the timing, it can be kind of staggered across regions. Um, and so, you know, the, the timing of that can kind of, uh, uh, it influences the timing. Um, for the angler uh, survey here, um, there's also not much in the way of, of uh, demographic information. There is some more demographic information, uh, in particular on the durable expenditures survey. Um, so durable expenditures uh, capture things like uh, fishing tackle and gears, durable, what we call durable goods, um, which are, are kind of uh, uh, things that don't necessarily change on, on say trip level basis. Um, so, so Ben, would, would this be the same as uh, how do we call that? You know, fixed, fixed kind of uh, cost or expenditure, so capital expenditure. Is that the same as durable? Um, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. Thanks. Um, so, uh, on the durable expenditure survey, we get uh, uh, age and sex, as well as race and, race and ethnicity, um, uh, education. Um, one difference between this and some of the and the other surveys is that, in contrast to the uh, four higher survey, um, which looks at trip level expenditures, uh, this survey focuses more on 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 annual uh, on annual expenditures kind of throughout the year. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know if we want to do quick questions or if we want to save questions for the end. Um, I'll leave that up to the moderator, but uh, I'm happy to kind of try and answer any questions. Uh, we also have uh, Sabrina Lavelle and uh, Eric here. Um, who I might lean on, uh, kind of depending on on what the question may be. Thank you, Ben. I, I think questions for clarification. I see Stephen's hand up. Yeah, thank you. Just a very quick question about what's the spatial scale that this information from these surveys is usually communicated back in? Is it state level or does it get down to fishing communities or how does it usually, you know, aggregated after the surveys are completed? Um, well, so it's going to depend a lot on the survey. Uh, you know, if we're talking about we aggregate things and we report them on a public basis up to the state level. Um, some of these, uh, um, some of these data, um, will include kind of location specific elements to them. And so in that sense, hypothetically with the raw data, one can aggregate them to kind of a smaller scale. Um, but in terms of just what we report, for example, in the in the FEUS, uh, we kind of aggregate things uh, at the state level. Um, Matt, you're up next, and then Grant. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I found the figure that uh, showed the different coverage of cost data collection across regions to be quite useful in terms of thinking the variation across regions. Has anyone put together something like that for some of the other types of data that we might be interested in, in particular like permit data, crew data? I know you mentioned that it's quite variable across regions about how that's collected and reported. Um, so yeah, has anyone put together a similar figure for that type of data or other type of data? Um, certainly not that I'm aware of. Um, some of that information would be kind of nested within the cost data. Um, and so it would be kind of be like, for example, crew uh, or, or say crew remun remunerations. 
uh, something like that might be part of the cost data collection. Um, but to my knowledge, no, we don't have a kind of similar graphic. Uh, and uh, I mean, somebody may have tabulated it, but it wasn't me, uh, or I don't know about it. If we have like uh, how much, you know, on a national scale, how much, how many, how many vessels or how much coverage of crew data, for example, we kind of have, it's going to be less than what it is for the, for example, the cost survey, because it's a subset of that, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ben. Grant. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, just on the for hire sector, I was struck by the, the fact that there seemed to be a lot of variability in terms of the granularity and quality of the demographic information collected across those different survey types. Is, is there an overarching reason for that, like a privacy law or restriction on what we can do, or is it just idiosyncratic to the way each of those surveys developed over time? So I'm going to lean on Sabrina here, who's really our, our uh, recreational kind of fishing uh, uh, expert, and she will kind of know the, the genesis of these programs and, and will be able to better answer your question. Yeah. Hi, this is Sabrina. Um, so it's it's more idiosyncratic where like different regions just felt like they wanted to do a survey and they kind of came up with their own, you know, survey questionnaire, depending on the issues in their region and, and you know, trying to limit the survey so it wasn't too long, et cetera. Um, the, the thing that we have at OMB now is hybrid generic. We've looked at all the surveys in the different regions for the four hire coming up, trying to come up with a set of accepted questions that like a question bank um, and that would pull from all the different surveys that have been done in the regions. Um, so hopefully for the next round, it can be a little more standardized. Thanks. Thanks all. And I think I'll turn it over to Lisa at this point. All right. Thanks, Ben. Lisa, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm Lisa Colburn. I'm with Ben at the Office of Science and Technology Economics and Social Analysis Division. Uh, I am presenting today with Danica Kleiber, who's at the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. And um, I will let, uh, or Danica will begin. She covers uh, aspects of the NOAA equity and environmental justice uh, strategy uh, within NIMS. Uh, I will talk about uh, the primary, um, the secondary data that we use, and then Danica will um, go into the, the primary data collection that the agency is involved in. And so I'm passing it off to you, Danica. Okay. Uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? And can you see the screen? Awesome, thank you. Um, so as uh, Lisa said, I am a social scientist with the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. Um, and since 2021, I have also been a co-chair of the NOAA Fisheries National Equity and Environmental Justice Working Group, which is supported and led by Sam Rausch. So first I'm gonna share a little bit about our EEJ efforts. Um, so equity is the fair treatment of all individuals, taking into account the fact that not everybody has been treated fairly um, throughout our, our history. And environmental justice is equity applied to environmental laws, policies, and practices. Within the strategy, we talk a lot about underserved communities. That's the term we've settled on. There are other terms, frontline communities, historically marginalized communities. Because we are the National Marine Fisheries Service, we settled on underserved communities. Um, within the strategy, we uh, identify uh, underserved communities. These could be designated by geographic areas. So for example, rural communities, territorial communities. It could also be based on demographic attributes. So um, race and ethnicity, gender identity, et cetera. But we also recognize um, there are certain fisheries groups that have been understudied or um, underengaged with. So this could include crew um, as well as uh, process plant workers, et cetera. So um, the federal government recognizes through executive orders and other mandates um, that barriers to equity have left many communities underserved. And these communities are often the most vulnerable to environmental issues such as climate change. So this isn't a new thing. It started um, under the Clinton administration with the Environmental Justice and Minority Populations 
and low income populations. Um, however, there's been renewed interest both through uh, the EO on advancing racial equity and the one on uh, tackling climate, the climate crisis home and abroad. So within the strategy, we've identified um, three main goals. Uh, you'll notice that the third goal in particular points out the need for demonstrable progress, which highlights the need for data. Within that, we've uh, identified six core areas where improvement is needed throughout our uh, agency. Um, the ones I'm going to focus in on our first uh, benefits, because I think this relates directly to this research. Um, so distributed, dis, uh, distribute benefits equitably among our stakeholders by increasing access to opportunities for underserved communities. Um, but of course, this also points to the research and monitoring uh, area where we identify underserved communities, address their needs and support collaborative knowledge sharing and assess impacts of management decisions. So now I'm going to hand it back to Lisa. Great, thanks, Danica. Um, so I'll lead off, and if you could go to the next slide, Danica. Um, I'll lead off this section by talking about a uh, secondary uh, data that's used to create some indices uh, that are used by NOAA. Um, it's uh, called the Community Social Vulnerability Indicator Toolbox. This data is available online uh, at, for download, as well as there are query tools available. Uh, the indicators were developed uh, to address different mandates, including social impact assessments as part of environmental impact statements, and as well as uh, improving the ability to conduct uh, environmental justice assessments. They are, the indicators are uh, at the place-based community level, uh, and that was in relation to addressing aspects of National Standard 8, uh, which is the fishing community uh, national standard. Uh, the project uh, or the indicators began uh, in a, a micro version of the indicators, uh, uh, the initial test was done uh, it, on, I think, 120 communities. Uh, and uh, also, uh, once the indicators were developed, they were ground truth uh, with social scientists in each of three communities uh, for about two months each community. So uh, then it grew into a, a NOAA fisheries project uh, where we uh, developed the indicators from Maine to Texas. We also ground truth those indicators by once they were created, uh, we went into uh, communities and asked and gathered information on how well did the social vulnerability indicators reflect the conditions in the communities that we visited. Uh, after that um, phase, we then went national uh, with this with this effort, and so now it uh, it's, it goes across uh, 14 indicators across 24 states, and we have over uh, 4,000 communities in coastal counties uh, around the United States. Uh, but the part of the um, the, the challenge with this project was that it needed to be done, it needed to be feasible with available resources, that it was not intended to be a primary data collection effort, but to make the best use of available data. And uh, with that, our approach uh, has been to use, create indices uh, with US Census American Community Survey data, as well as some uh, NOAA fisheries data and, uh, and some Office of uh, NOAA Ocean Service data on sea level rise and storm surge. Uh, the, each indicator has, uh, is, is calculated with approximately four to five variables. Uh, the indicator categories in the lower right-hand side of the screen include fishing dependence, we have four uh, fishing dependence indicators 
two for commercial and two for recreational uh, fishing. Uh, we have environmental justice indicators, which I'll, I'll provide the example of uh, in the next slide, uh, some uh, indicators covering economic conditions, gentrification pressure, uh, which is a, an important threat to commercial and recreational working waterfronts. And then we have storm surge and sea level rise indicators. Uh, I notated in the lower right that all uh, of the uh, environmental justice, economic, uh, and uh, gentrification pressure indicators are constructed with uh, the American Community Survey data. If you could go to the next slide. So this is an example of each of the, the three uh, environmental justice indicators and the census data that's used to uh, calculate each of the, the indices. Uh, this data is capture, it captures uh, at the community level and we're able to update it annually. Uh, if you could go on to the next slide. So what are some of the caveats around the use of secondary data? Uh, and some of the strengths are um, it's the best available data um, that, which is part of the charge of analysis with the Magnuson Act. Um, it's place-based community analysis so that it can begin to address national standard aid. Uh, it's, they're updated annually and it, national in scope. In terms of weaknesses uh, or challenges, uh, the ACS data, which are five-year rolling estimates, um, are aggregated. The, the data for fisheries is aggregated with hunting. So uh, when we are looking at and trying to use the census data specifically to identify um, the importance of fishing as an occupation, it is now aggregated with fishing and hunting. Uh, what we have looked at and are continuing to look at is the extent to which fishing would be a more primary occupation potentially in, in coastal areas and hunting might be a more inland uh, occupation. Uh, however, this is, this is a challenge uh, definitely. And it's also a challenge in terms of who is sampled with the ACS. Uh, we may not, it may not capture all fishing community uh, participants, uh, crew, uh, fish processing workers, subsistence fishermen. These may be captured, but they may not be captured depending on uh, the size of the sample in a place. And then, of course, because their estimates were dealing with um, potential uh, standard error, and we're, we're very aware of that uh, in terms of the, the use of the data. Now, some directions we're currently going in are the use of micro data. Uh, one uh, very basic question that we are asking is what is the gender uh, composition of the fishing industry in the United States. And uh, we are working with uh, set the Census Bureau to disaggregate data so that we might be able to say something about as on a national level, just a national level. And then perhaps depending on the results of the national analysis, how far down can we go? Can we go to the state? Can we go down to the community? And with that, I'll pass it on to Danica to talk about um, the primary data streams. Thank you, Lisa. So as has been covered already, uh, we have some, we have, we've identified two different um, data streams for prim primary data. So first is uh, mandatory permits and reporting. Um, so these are the most consistent sources of longitudinal data for commercial fisheries. Um, there are cur currently limits on demographic questions that can be included in permits and reporting forms used by NOAA um, 
However, the other one is voluntary surveys. Uh, demographic questions are often are, are allowed to be included in these surveys. Um, however, uh, it's not consistent, um, as has already been discussed, and I'll, I'll show um, some more data on that. Uh, furthermore, these, these surveys are infrequently longitudinal, either by design or due to inconsistent funding. So we're unable to, or often unable to use these in concert with longitudinal ecological data, um, or to understand or predict the effects of ecological change or regulations. Um, so what I did is uh, I did a review of all of NOAA Fisheries primary data collection forms. I created a repository with um, the help of my colleague, uh, Mia Awane. Uh, we used a PRE search and found 565 uh, NOAA Fisheries um, forms and surveys that, that deal directly with fisheries. We characterized each of these surveys um, by the type of former survey, the fisheries sector that it targeted, and uh, whether uh, core demographic questions were collected. So first of all, you can see that most of the forms that we use are mandatory, either mandatory permit applications or mandatory reporting, which uh, applicants have to complete to maintain their benefits. Um, a much smaller percentage are voluntary surveys. When we look at uh, which fisheries are focused, you can see that um, the majority are focused on commercial fisheries with a smaller number devoted to recreational and also other non-commercial fisheries. In terms of demographic data collected, as you can see um, among the mandatory forms, uh, core demographic questions on gender and sex, race, race and ethnicity and age are very uncommon. Um, and then questions of geography, which often come through questions like, what, what is your uh, ad address? It tells us where the people live. Uh, that, that does get asked much more often. In terms of the voluntary surveys, you will see that the core demographic questions are asked more frequently. However, it is not across the board um, and it's not consistent. In an effort to try and uh, have cr greater Christian uh, consistency not only within NMFS but across no line offices. Uh, we created um, we've created a tech memo, which is in review. Um, but we worked with uh, social scientists across uh, our line offices, and we wanted to gather all the possible demographic questions that we could be asking. So we went to the literature, we looked at executive orders, we looked at uh, our social vulnerability indices, um, and we asked each other. And together we identified uh, 19 demographic categories. First, we identified three core uh, demographic categories that we believe based on the history of the United States and uh, the interest of the fisheries should always be asked on voluntary surveys, if not um, permits. So that's race and ethnicity, gender and sex, and age. Um, and then as you can see, several of the uh, executive orders identify many other types of uh, demographic categories. So um, we, such as, uh, let's see, poverty, sexual orientation, disability, um, and geographic features like rurality. Okay, but the CSVI also brings up demographic questions such as language use, education, and employment. Um, there were additional categories that didn't come up in any of these other cases, but were identified by the co-authors for being important for their region or their line office. For example, the National Weather Service, whether you have a vehicle available is very important, um, may not be so important to fisheries. Uh, I want to end with just a, a, a few slides on our capacity for this work. So one in 60 uh, scientists hired by NOAA, this is NOAA-wide, is a social, behavioral, or economic scientist. If we dig into this, um, uh, most are, are from the economic sciences. So there's 102 uh, social and economic scientists within NOAA at the moment. So. This isn't just NMFS, but if we drill down to NMFS, again, this, this mirrors uh, Ben's um, uh, slide. Uh, so we have 50 economists and 14 so social scientists. Most um, are within the science centers, fewer, many fewer in the regional offices and program offices. That 
Lisa and I are open to questions. Thank you both. Uh, we'll start with clarifying questions from the presentation and then um, if there is time, uh, broaden up to other questions that are in people's minds. Rachel? Yeah, thanks to you both for for walking us through that. It was, it was, I found it really helpful. I did have a question um, and I don't know who best to direct it to, but earlier we heard that, um, you know, often some of the mandatory reporting in commercial fisheries tends to capture a mailing address versus the home residence of a permit holder. And then Danica, I think you were walking through some of that um, demographic data as capturing geographic residents. And is that capturing the home residents of permit holders or the home port? And are there issues that we need to think about in terms of making that type of um, demographic data collection mandatory when it comes to commercial fisheries? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, when I, uh, for that category, I didn't drill down to that level of detail. If they asked any sort of uh, question related to either residents or where the fish, uh, fisheries was done, um, I just included that. So we, we could get into to more detail and I, yeah. Rachel, do you have a follow-up or a vestigial hand? Yeah, it's, I guess the follow-up would be, and maybe, um, is it, is it Ben um, Fissel? Am I getting that name right? Is there issues with making that type of data collection mandatory that we should be thinking about? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Eric has, well, so first of all, only, not all of the data collections are national NIMS level. Some of them are, for example, uh, state level data collections. So when we think about some of those, um, particularly like think about, uh, well, I used to work for the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And so a lot of the data that we rely on there is, for example, on fish tickets. And so you might kind of gather your information from there. Um, but fish tickets are collected by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, and so um, getting some of that information, I mean, we have more control over some information than we do, than we do over others, um, is basically kind of what it boils down to. Um, in terms of like difficulty on getting that uh, into a survey, I mean, basically you, when we, anytime we change surveys, we have to go through PRA, the Paperwork Reduction Act, uh, which kind of requires us to get clearance from uh, OMB. Um, so there's another negotiation that has to happen there as well. Um, but I mean, it's it, it's definitely possible. Yeah, I, you know, it's, but it's not like, a, it's not something that we can just change on the survey uh, right away. Um, it's more, there's a process, I guess. Um, Eric, Eric Thunberg, did you have a response to the question? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the, um, so the permit application is, uh, it is a mailing address because it tells you where to, where to send the permit. I just, it, oftentimes it is a residence, um, it, it, but you don't know for sure. There are other ways to triangulate um, that information because sometimes they also ask for a primary port or a home port or something along those lines. So you can compare those types of things. You can also repair, you can also potentially compare um, basically where people actually land um, and to, to see, to type, to determine other, because primary and principal port are things that um, are part of the permanent application process. They're before they actually fish. Um, so a, 
expectation of what you think you're going to do for the year may not match what you actually do. Um, Thank you, Eric. Um, Grant, uh, you're next, and then Kellen. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I think this maybe is for Lisa. I was interested in this um, social vulnerability indicator data that you shared, and I'm wondering about the relationship between census data, which I assume can be disaggregated down to the census tract level, and then this notion of geographic community. In other words, are you combining census tracts? Can we disaggregate beyond the community level? Where, where are we at with that? Um, they, it is possible to go down to the tract level. And other uh, social vulnerability uh, 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 tools like the EPA EJ screen, I mean, there's a number of them that are out there, often go down to the track level, uh, but that is less useful for the purposes of national standard eight analysis. So, uh, however, um, if other types of analysis that could be done at the track level might capture neighborhoods where processing plant workers live, for example, or where crew live. But at this point, we don't use track level. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Uh, Kaylin, you're next on the questions. Great, yeah, thanks. So I have a question that relates to, I guess the first presentation about management and in particular thinking about national standard eight and sustained community participation, but then trying to tie that in with Lisa, uh, your presentation on the indicators. And you mentioned one of the um, driving forces behind developing some of the indicators was something like national standard eight. Um, and I'm wondering if you've thought about, or this has been discussed, or written about how do we relate these indicators to national standard eight? And so uh, are there particular indicators that you think if, for example, we saw a decline in would be a flag in terms of decreased or sort of negative sustained uh, community participation? Um, and sort of a corollary to that, well, have you thought about or talked about or seen examples of how that then fits into the management process? She looks frozen. Yeah. <laughs> I stunned her with the question. I stumped her with that one, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, Is there anyone else who wishes to take a swing at an answer to that while we wait for Lisa to unfreeze? Yeah, so this is Lindsay. I mean, so uh, one of the things I didn't mention with the national standards, this doesn't really answer your question, but it's a thought I have along these lines. Um, one of the uh, uh, things I didn't mention about the national standards is they have varying levels of, um, what's the phrase, like uh, requirements, right? So national standard one says prevent overfishing, but national standard eight says consider the importance of fishery resources to communities. Um, so there's a lot of, um, flexibility within the list of 10 national standards. Where that more, um, maybe more relevantly comes in is in council deliberations and public input and how much is the council willing to reduce um, the allocations to certain entities or reduce the overall catch for a lot of reasons. Uncertainty in management is one of them, but um, impact on communities is another one of those. Um, so. Can I ask just a follow up? I think that's, that's really true. I guess this is something that I'm wrestling with more broadly. So then 
you called out some of the national standards, but I didn't hear you talk about national standard two. And so we're here talking about information and data. And so I, I could argue we're talking about best scientific information available. And then I would think maybe there is language about what should be included in the safe documents. And if this kind of community level information indicator type information, is that best scientific information available? Um, and then, you know, what national standard does it does it fit under? And so maybe this is a question for, for you about even the national standards that you thought were most important here, because that that is clear about what you would be sort of reporting each year. It's a fair, <laughs> fair point, fair question. I don't, um, I think you're, you've got the right issue in mind. I don't. I don't and that's okay. Yeah, I was keen. <laughs> I was glad Lisa was here. So we'll see if she comes back. Yeah. I am actually back if you had a question. Apologies. Internet lost. You're back by voice, Lisa, I know. And the question that Kaylin asked initially was, how do we relate the um, the community vulnerability indexes to National Standard 8? And then how does that relate to management? So if, if you... Oh, yeah. OK. Um, so relating the indicators to the phishing community, um, we have the phishing dependence indicators, which link uh, the community uh, in terms of the importance of phishing. But those indicators capture commercial and recreational phishing. They do not capture um, landing um, uh, seafood processing facilities and other types of shoreside infrastructure. Uh, that um, where um, employment in the fishing industry is really critical. Uh, however, um, they are used in social impact assessments to understand um, how, uh, in particular, the fishing dependence indicators, how uh, communities, uh, their level of dependence on a particular fishery may have changed over time. And then the, the social aspects of the indicators are used to describe the current conditions, mostly the current conditions in, in fishing communities. And could they be used as a time series? All right. They, you know, I know often it's been more of a kind of one-off um, production in terms of some of the reports. But when I think of sustained fishing participation, that to me is a more of a long run kind of we should measure it each year and track it question. So the, as I said, the commercial and recreational indicators um, are based, uh, you know, those are updated annually with annual data. And they do, you know, this sounds funny, but they, they reflect, they reflect change and are sensitive to change in the industry on an annual basis. The social indicators are based on census data, five-year rolling average estimates. And so they are less sensitive as a time series. It would have to be a, a very big shock um, to, to then be reflected in, um, in change in the, the social conditions in, in the community. And so that's why I describe them as um, best used right now as um, reflecting the current conditions or the conditions in the most current year. Tom, I think you're trying to speak, but you're muted. We can't hear you. Three years in, still forgetting. Um, I do want to note that we have a break coming up, but I know Rashid has been waiting patiently with his hand raised. So I'm going to give the last question to Rashid. Rashid, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so when I listened to Ben and then I listened to uh, Danica and uh, was it Lisa? Yeah, 
right? I, it seems to me that Ben's talk is, when I hear Ben's talk, I can say fisheries management simply benefits the commercial and the recreational, right? Because in your talk, you said this is not about subsistence, it's not about native or tribal fisheries, you know, so it's mainly commercial. And then I hear the two of you and you are talking about issues that really relate to small scale, to indigenous or, or native fisheries and, you know, fisheries where there are black people active or even women, you know. So I kind of see like the two don't quite match. Am I missing something? Can I can I can to that. Oh, well, th thank you, Rashid. This actually ties into one of the things I'd raise my hand for. Um, so one of the issues we have with the ACS data is that it does not include uh, the US territories and Commonwealth. So uh, Guam, CNMI, American Samoa, US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. Um, so these are places that have been identified as being underserved communities at the national scale, and they are also data poor. Um, so some of these larger national scale data collection just don't occur in these areas. So um, I think that's that's one of the issues we we do wrestle with this because our our fishing mandate is for federal fishing waters. A lot of the smaller scale fisheries occur in state or territorial or commonwealth waters. Um, and yet there's 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 definitely overlap. Um, and so I think the work that I focus on, we're as social scientists, we're also trying to expand the types of fishing. I believe under, I'm not um, Magnus and Stevens expert, but at the moment, I believe there's only two types of fishing that are identified, commercial and recreational. We are trying to expand that definition because at least in our region, that binary uh, doesn't adequately reflect uh, the fisheries that is done even in federal waters. Um, and also, I, I know we are very focused here on economics, but we're also trying to expand the values of fisheries that gets included uh, beyond just, just economic values. So what are other things that we can measure for how people benefit from and value their fisheries? So that's just to say, Rishi, this is an ongoing uh, conversation. Um, so I think you you add you <laughs> very um, astutely picked up on that tension. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, and and I would just add that I don't think you're missing anything, Rashid. Um, you know, I think that for maybe for a long long time uh, historically, like with the fisheries focus has been on the maximization of something, whether or not that's profit or catch or kind of whatever it is and the move to kind of more distributed uh, uh, considerations. Um, I'm not gonna call it recent, um, but it's, it's, it's developing. And I think that that's exactly what this committee is, uh, you know, here to help us consider and, and you know, as a, as a science and an agency. Um. All right, um, Kelly, is, is it a quick response? Yes, thank you, Tom. I just wanted to say maybe just one, two quick things um, cause I'm trying to wrap it up to get to a break. I think an observation uh, that I would share which you all are hitting on with your comments and questions is, um, can you all hear me? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry, I saw Tom reaching for his headphones, and so I was like, oh, maybe I forgot to unmute. Um, <clears throat> is uh, we have a, a patchwork of data collection in, in this area. And I think as you've seen through the presentations, at least in my eyes, it's driven kind of by two components. The first is our council process, uh, which is where a lot of the, the data collection requirements uh, derive from. Um, and that is a very different process because there are very different dynamics within each of those councils. Then even once the agency um, gets that information from the councils, then we have to go through our federal process, which includes the Paperwork Reduction Act and some of the challenges that that can present. So you have that kind of, in my mind, kind of column of, of work. And then the other is 
um, some of the surveys and things that we want to do to collect information to drive our science, um, our social and economic science. And so then that is, is largely challenged by resources and the Paperwork Reduction Act and the different hoops that we need to go through in order to conduct those kinds of surveys. And at multiple steps in each of those processes, we face a lot of questions and reticence in providing that information. Um, and I'm, I don't think I'm telling any of you anything you don't already know, but I did just want to hit on those couple of things before we went to a, a break. So thank right. you for that indulgence, Tom. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, I will call break. Uh, when we come back from the break, we have uh, um, Bonnie McKay briefing us. Bonnie was the um, chair of a recent National Academies Committee on the use of limited access privilege programs in mixed-use fisheries um, and she's going to be giving the committee a report out, um, followed by questions and answers. Uh, I invite all of those from NOAA who are on the call, you're more than welcome to stay with us um, for Bonnie's report if you would wish to do so. Um, the advantage to us of you staying with us is that if additional questions come up that cross over between that report and the information we've heard from you, um, this afternoon, you'll be available to answer those questions. But we also understand if you have other comp competing um, demands on, on your time and have to leave us. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of the presenters um, today, uh, Lindsay, Ben, Lisa, and da Danica for your presentations and for your thoughtful answers to our questions. And um, I'm going to call break at 10 to 3, and we'll be back at 3 o'clock. It will be the same Zoom link, so I assume you can just leave your ca cameras off uh, and um, go and get a well-earned cu cup of tea. Thank you all. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. All right, it's three o'clock, so I'd like to just call folks back to their computers if they've left them so that we can get started on time. And Bonnie, um, since I see you're here, you, did you want to share your own screen or would you like me to do it for you? Wait, hold on. I can, I can share mine, I think. Okay. We'll try That's that. Good. And if, it, if I can't do it within one minute, then you can take over. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. <laughs> we sure appreciate you being here. We'll just give another second or two maybe for folks to come back. And um, Tom, I think I'll turn it over to you. Um, oh, but now you're muted again. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to go? Do it. We all have fresh ca caffeine so so sources. Um, Bonnie, welcome. Welcome back to uh, National Academy's Consensus. Thank and you. Um, thank you for making uh, your time available today to brief us on um, the LAP report that you were the chair for. Um, just as a little bit of background for you, I'm sure Stacy provided it. But um, th this consensus study committee has been asked by uh, NOAA Fisheries to assess equity in the distribution of fisheries management benefits and paying particular attention in a phase one on data and information availability. In our first meeting, um, we focused on one particular part of the statement of task, which was the distribution of primary benefits. And several of us mentioned the report that you had um, chaired that looked at, at benefits in limited access pr privileged fisheries. And so we thought you were a great resource to um, help us 
work our way through our own statement of task and understand something about primary benefits and how your committee uh, dealt with that I issue as well. So uh, w welcome back. Um, I'll ask you, I know you know many of the committee mem members already, but perhaps a short bio to begin with and, and then uh, in, into your presentation. And if you would like the committee, what, why don't we do that? We'll go through the committee. It's a very quick in, in, in introduction to all, uh, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll hand the mic over to you. So um, my name is Tom Miller. I'm chair of the committee, and I'm at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Um, also on the committee, but not here today, is Lisa Campbell, mm -hmm. um, a member of the Ocean St St Studies Board and a social scientist at Duke Marine Lab. Um, alphabetically, uh, Rachel. Rachel, if you'd go next. Hi, Bonnie. Uh, Rachel Donkersloat. I'm a social scientist working in Alaska fisheries. Yeah. Nice to see you. You too. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Kaylin, I think you're next. Great. Yes. Uh, hi, Bonnie. So I'm Kaylin Kretz. I'm at Arizona State University in the School of Sustainability, and I'm trained as an economist. Great. Uh, nice to meet you, Kaylin. Grant. Hi, Bonnie. It's yeah. nice to see you. Nice uh, to see you. <laughs> as, as I think you know, I'm a faculty member in, at the yes. Duke Marine Lab now, and I'm a former postdoc of Bonnie, so personal <laughs> moment here. Nice yeah. to see you. It comes full circle every now and again in life. Uh, Matt Reimer. Matt. Hi, Bonnie. I'm Matt Reimer. Uh, I'm an economist uh, professor at UC Davis in the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, Jim. Jim Santurico. San Sorry, Jim. Hi, hi, Bonnie. Jim Sankirico, professor at the University of California, Davis in environmental science and policy. Good to see you. Hi, Jim. Uh, Stephen, Stephen Cyphers. Hi, Bonnie. I'm Stephen Cyphers. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Alabama in the School of Marine and Environmental Sciences and the Department of Sociology. Wonderful. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet and you. And last but no means least, Rashid Shumaila. <laughs> hey, hey, Bonnie, good to see you. Yeah. I, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm still at UBC, okay? Since we met years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. look forward to your talk, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, that's it. That's all, all, all of us. So. Well, it's wonderful to see you all. I, I know some of you very, very well, and it's great to see you again, and I'm glad to meet some of the rest of you, and I know, you know some, of, some of your work. And uh, wow, another another cast of, of stars on one of these committees, I can see that. So if you want me to, I can go on now, or Please the, do. perhaps the staff would like to introduce oh, themselves. Sorry, that's, I, I forgot that this, this time. I'm usually the one that reminds <laughs> Stacy for that, but the staff should go. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Bonnie, Bonnie and I know each other well. We worked together on this lab study, but... Uh, as a reminder, senior program officer with the Ocean Studies Board. Uh, and I'll just highlight, having now gone through the roster of our committee, that I think you'll see some familiar um, areas of expertise and geographic representation uh, from the lab study, and very likely some of the same issues I'm sure will come up uh, in this study as came up in that. So we're so appreciative that you can share your wisdom having shared that study. Um, and any lessons learned that we can take with us into this one. I'll turn it to Leanne and then Eric. Hi, Leanne Martin. I'm a research associate on the Ocean Studies Board. Hi, Leanne. Hi, uh, Eric Inesco. I'm a program assistant on the Ocean Studies Board. Nice to meet you, too. Good. You as well. Okay, so I guess I, I try not to take too much of your time because you've got a lot to handle here. So I'm going to launch this through share screen. And, and I've got to get rid of this stuff, first of all. OK, there we go. All right, so anyway, I'm, it was uh, 
I was I was pleased to hear that somebody wanted to hear about our report. It seems like it's been a long time, <laughs> but of course, uh, yeah, I. The, it just, it sounds, I'll just say quickly that it sounds to me like this committee is in some ways a follow up to our report. And I'm glad to see that. In any case, you're dealing with some of the key, the, one of the key issues that we certainly confronted in this, our report, which was called the use of limited access privilege programs or LAPS, as the acronym has, become, has sort of come into play uh, in mixed use fisheries. And that meant in this case, primarily, almost entirely, fisheries that have both commercial, significant commercial and recreational sectors uh, competing for the same species. And so the committee members, as Stacey said, are very, you know, but from a variety of backgrounds that are very similar to the backgrounds that you represent, uh, myself and anthropology, um, Josh Abbott, Lee Anderson, um, well, uh, uh, Marty Smith, Etc. from economics, um, uh, Courtney Carruthers, also in anthropology, um, Tracy Yandel, kind of, a, you know, sustainability, uh, mixed, uh, multidisciplinary, Sean Powers, um, mostly out of economics, recreational fisheries, Steve Morowski, biology, Tim Essington, biology and ecology, Josh the Eagle, law, law, and Jim Cowan, um, who actually is deceased now, uh, biology, but anyway, there are people who have really strong backgrounds in fisheries in different parts of the of the country, and um, and agreed to in take on this this endeavor, which was um, a big challenge. Uh, but what we were asked to look at, and I'm just summarizing it. I'm not going to read the, the official statement, uh, but basically look at the social, economic, and ecological effects on of of changes in a fishery that included these, that that amounted to these limited access privilege programs. Basically, IFQs, and I think in almost all cases, ITQs in the classic way. Um, so they look at the effects on the fishery per se, on the stakeholders, the key stakeholders, and on the communities. And we were supposed to look at those effects and then also talk about the best practices in using LAP programs in mixed use fisheries and then policies to avoid negative impacts. And the fisheries that we were told, asked to look at were the red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. And that was actually the red snapper and the grouper tilefish in the Gulf of Mexico. They were really key to um, a lot of the, the, the issues uh, that were brought forward here, more, the very complex fisheries and um, in some ways the political uh, motivation for this study. Wreckfish, South Atlantic, which was the, the first, I think, the first federal waters ITQ program, and golden tilefish in the mid Atlantic. Um, and whoops, I'm sorry, backed up. And uh, I, I've got your faces covering up the last part, the bluefin tuna, which is managed by the, by the headquarters. And a bluefin tuna is an in, individual um, bifish quota and not, not a it's not individual bluefin quota, it's individual bycatch quota. Um, so those are, those are the study fisheries and the management councils associated with them. Um, and so we were supposed to look at all of each one of those and answer these questions about the effects, the various effects of the fisheries and best practices for future management. And, and we identified two major methodological challenges and one of them is looking at this kind of thing. Of course, the, the, most of the data available have to do with before the change was instituted and after it was instituted. And this is a very limited way of understanding causation, as you all know. And so um, there are lots of other things to take into account. And, and this is something we, had, we kept, had to keep reminding ourselves of, of this as we went through and looked at each one of the programs. And as we read the reviews that are already made of the ITQ programs and LAP programs by the various uh, councils, which are required to do that. So this was really important as we assess the nature of the evidence and the strength of the evidence in, in drawing conclusions about the social, ecological, and economic effects of the programs. 
And the second methodological challenge was the very interdisciplinarity of the topic itself and of our composition as a committee and of the, the nature of our, our backgrounds. And this affects the kinds of models that we bring to the study. Um, you know, the, you all understand the, those differences, you know, from an economics perspective. Um, open access, for example, is a problem and something like a LAP program is, is a particularly attractive way of addressing those problems and uh, focus on profit and market mechanisms of change and human geography, anthropology, et cetera, sociology, a more place-based uh, approach to things. And looking at um, other things besides, in addition to goals of profit and um, creation of wealth, but also workings of power, the importance of how people are related to each other, et cetera. And that and access itself becomes a really interesting and more problematic kind of variable. And then, of course, the other one is the standards of evidence that we hold to. And this is where this is where our committee spent a lot of lot of time. Um, you know, there's some some powerful differences of opinion, and um, differences in in background and so forth. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing is coming up to ways to understand. In, understand these differences and to look for ways that we can work together and bring the bring the strengths of the different approaches, not just the difference between economics and anthropology, let's say, because that's a there's a lot of a lot of difference in ways of general approaches, but the kinds of data that we have, the kinds of sampling, the degree of, of representative representativeness, and the, whether the samples are large enough to use statistics and so on and so forth, these kinds of questions. And then what do we do with the kind of qualitative information that comes from the more sociological and ethnographic approaches and how do, how do we relate those to each other? So this was, this was a, probably the biggest challenge. And I, although it didn't, I don't think it appeared in our final report, but one of the things we often talked about is we really needed to have a serious in-person retreat a workshop that we, where we could come to some you get some ideas about how to do this better, but we really worked hard doing that. And um, I'd say the investment that we put into it was large and, and I, it was worthwhile, I think for most of the part, I think all the participants. So anyway, we did what we could as a committee over a fairly long period of time and having to have only virtual meetings. We did what we could, we had um, lots, of, lots of data from uh, fisheries reports and the fisheries data, various kinds, and interviews with people, uh, lots of re um, representat representatives of different councils and different fisheries talked with us, huge amount of data coming into us for this. We did what we could over this period of time and we came up with the overall finding that the use of the laps in these mixed use fisheries show little effect of the laps on the recreational and for hire um, stakeholders, and they're in, in the, so there's that that question is one where we could not figure out, and we could not see any evidence for the effects of the lapse per se. And the second finding was that where we did see the outcomes of the lapse, their their effects, their consequences, the impacts, they're very similar to what we would see in lapse that are not mixed use components. Now going back to the first one about the recreational, the impacts on the recreational, this was a really big issue that behind the, the creation of this study. So we gave it, gave it a great deal of attention. And certainly to many of the participants in, in the fisheries that we looked at, especially the Gulf fisheries, the, uh, the ITQ programs there for Red Snapper and the grouper tilefish complex were, were viewed as barriers to the to well as as cutting back on the benefits available to to the recreational stakeholders, and you know there's a whole new class, a whole new class was created with the creation of ITQs. A whole new political social group is created, and they function as such in council meetings and deliberations about about allocations, and they also function in 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 the legal uh, legal domain. So yes, laps are there and they, they are viewed as, as a problem. 
from from the perspective of of many of the people in the recreational communities. But we found no evidence for the direct effects of lapse on either the private recreational anglers or the or the people who run charter and party boats. We had a we have a, a had a sense, and this comes mainly from what we came to know about the Gulf Council um, recent history, that lapse could actually affect a, rec a mixed use fishery by improving the accountability of all sectors to the management, uh, management uh, rules, greater accountability because the, the lapse tend to, well, because of the way that they're designed, the participants in these ITQ programs are much more accountable. There's, they're carefully monitored. And so they're accountable for what their landings, for what they land and how they, how they operate. And this we suspected could lead to pressures to attain greater accountability on the part of the recreational sector. Although we don't have any direct evidence that that is the case. So that was, that was a one, an idea that came out of this that, has, that could be tested. And um, the red snapper is where this, this seems to possibly fit. And there was some talk in our report about the idea that, I, that some of you are familiar with, the idea that we could actually see the evolution of management organizations of, of private anglers, just as you have for um, ITQ holders and quota holders in, in the fishery or other, other organizations. And, and it's possible something like that could, could emerge sometime, sometime, but we did not certainly see any real sign of that. We, where that's, something like that is happening more is in the far, far higher sector an ex, on an experimental basis. So we did what we could. These are our overall findings. And then, but then as I mentioned, you know, that the outcomes that we found are very similar to what we'd find in other cases, but here they go. Okay, so what about these, these ITQ programs per se? And here the evidence, the strength of the evidence is reflect, reflecting our efforts to be really, really careful about whether it's just a before and after, whether we've taken into account other factors that might be in play. And also takes into account the kind of amount of data that we had, the quality of the data and so forth. So the economic impacts, very strong to strong, in terms of mediating the race to fish and increased profitability. Really good evidence in most cases for that. Um, some evidence for some reduction in overcapacity. And in, in, indeed, for example, there are some cases where the ITQ program comes into play after there's already been a reduction in capacity because of other factors that are going on and so forth. And then, with, then, um, then, then there's there is consolidation that occurs in this kind of fishery, which is a really important, um, you know, observed effect uh, in many cases. But the our finding was that that consolidation did not lead to market power, at least in the quota market. It didn't affect the 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 value of the quotas. We looked at the ecological or biological impacts. And we found in only one case a strong effect, and that was because the that was the individual bycatch quota program for bluefin tuna, uh, which was successful in reducing regulatory discards, which was the major purpose of that program. But in other cases, it was either weak or no evidence at all. Some modest benefit of improved stock status for some species, um, but the LAP programs themselves were not were not usually the um, the the, the evident causes of, of improvements. Other things have taken place. And this is another real big problem in assessing this kind of thing is that there's an awful lot going on when an ITQ program or other LAP program is created. There's often other changes that are occurring in uh, the ways, that, ways in which um, stocks are, are assessed and the kinds of rules that are being used to deal with uncertainty and so on and so forth. And we found in any case, there's no evidence that they've been bad for the, the biological dimension of the system. Okay, the last one is the social impacts. And this is, um, 
this here we found strong evidence for only one factor, which is improved safety at sea. And this is something that was always um, advocated as a reason for developing this kind of um, uh, I, ITQ or IFQ program. And we found evidence in, in the cases that the, that was the case. The effects on labor is another really big issue. And certainly this is where these, you know, distribution of benefits question comes into play. And looking at each one of these cases, we found very mixed and inconclusive evidence for uh, the effects of the lapse per se on labor in terms of the, the, how labor is compensated um, and, and that sort of thing. There's, there's an off, we gave a tremendous amount of attention to that question. And then the third, the third thing we were asked, by the way, to, to look, include in our notion of, of, of stakeholders, the communities per se, the, co the usually the coastal communities that were engaged in the fisheries. And this was a really big challenge for us. And there's no, there's no direct evidence of the effects of the LAP programs on communities. And this is largely because of the lack of good data for the social and community, both social generally and community impacts. So data emerged in that one as a really big problem. So I, we've already, you know, if, if, in our official slideshow, we would have one of these sections with the, the yellow up there for the effects on recreational, but I've already talked about that. The impacts on the commercial participants, number one, the way a lap is designed makes a big difference and has enduring effects. You know how the initial allocation is done is one really big example of that. And um, so we felt that um, councils, we were, you know, we recommended that the councils invest more in data collection and and ways to deliberate issues when designing the new laps and 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 uh, fixing the old, the old ones. It's a very big problem. You know, when the horses left the the barn, it's that's that's a real a legacy is created from the initial design of the lapse. It's very very difficult to to change. So particular attention has to be given in that case to initial allocation options for hired captains and crew to more fully participate. This is this is a really big issue in a lot of these programs, as you know, um, because the usually the the history of a boat becomes a commodity and, and the work of the hired captains and the crew is kind of factored into that history. And, and so the boat gets the, gets the goodies and not the captains and the crew. Um, and then the cost of new entry is another factor. The effects of, of uh, I get my, get my little, little head things there to keep emerging there, let me get rid of them. The effects of yeah, the effects of new entry on later generations. That's a huge, huge question. And the transparency and accessibility of markets for shares and allocations, another really big issue. And especially if you're looking at these, you know, distribution of benefits questions, who is actually engaged? How do we know them? What do we do about the use of corp corporation titles uh, as owners and so forth? How do we? How do we? Who? How do? How do we identify the actors, and and what difference does it make to make to identify them in different ways? How transparent and is it? Is it? What kind of market exists where the shares and allocations, and is that uh, something that is widely known and accessible to a large number of people, or is that also limited? And does that that will affect um, participation and distribution? And we had we had made a couple of recommendations. Here's one of, one of them here is that the crew and hired captains should be somehow given opportunities to play into the initial allocations. But then as you know, there are huge uh, data problems if not legal and, and equity issues involved in that. It, you know, how do you define what's fair, what is equitable? And um, I'm sure that you've already started talking about that, that question. Um, Huge one. Oops. So the impacts on fishing communities is where we really stumbled with the data problem. Um, you know, the 
people who've looked at, at ITQ and other LAP programs have you know, looked at the possibilities that you'll get increased social conflict, fewer jobs, or some you know, the movement of boats to different areas and the loss of product for, for uh, processing plants in particular places and so on and so forth. In other words, communities can be affected in different ways. And there's been a lot of concern about that. As you know, you know one of the reasons that uh, Congress back in the, when it was at the 90s, uh, put a, a, a moratorium on creating these programs was because of concerns about questions like this. But the lack of community data in, in the fisheries studies made it really difficult to look at the effects of laps on the modern fishing community, and especially when you have to talk about the fishing community in a mixed use form. What do we know about the recreational fishing community in that sense? In the, fishing community way of thinking about things. And where do we have those data? So this was a big question and we put a lot of effort into looking at it and talking around it and so forth. Our recommendations underscored, of course, the importance of more research on the human dimensions of fisheries and build on NOAA's data on social indicators. Now, I, I know you've already talked about that because Lisa's there and, uh, and I'm sure that that even my mention that you say, yeah, we know all about that. So, but this was something that we were really, really, really interested in, and we spent some time looking at it. Uh, so the toolbox um, issue, you already know all about this, and it's and we were just interested in its possible use in assessing the community impacts of fisheries changes. So this was uh, this was tempting to be us because there we were struggling with this issue of the quantitative versus the qualitative, the anthropologist versus the economist, et cetera, et cetera. Wow, look, here we have some information that social, social information that has been put together by this, the team at NOAA. And maybe, maybe we can do some uh, modeling work. Maybe we can come up with some ways that these data could be used in a, a more quantitative way. Um, these are the kinds of social indicators that you, you've already learned about through the presentation earlier, I'm sure. So I'll just skip on by that. But anyway, so if, in our study, there is a discussion of an effort that was, that was done by Josh Abbott primarily uh, to look at what was exist, the social indicators data on labor vulnerability and to come up with a way of taking two parts of Florida, the Gulf part and the Atlantic part. And the Gulf part is where the lap fisheries are and the, and the Atlantic part is where they are not, all right? But they're pretty much similar fisheries. It's very similar in um, composition of the, 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 uh, the species involved and so forth. And so uh, this, he, he went through the data and he, it's described in our report to have the details of how it was done. It's done very, very carefully and found no statistical significance. Um, that there does not seem to be, a, in this case, there's just no sign of, of, of uh, an effect of labor in these, in these coastal communities that are part of the social indicators um, snapshots. Of course, this is no big surprise because fisheries are only parts of coastal economies in this region. And, and there are also problems with the measures of labor vulnerability. Maybe they're not fine enough. They're certainly not directed to these particular fisheries and so forth. But it's a really teasing start, suggesting the potentials for the use of these data and the importance of NOAA's support for continuing, to, continuing this project as, as is happening and refining them were appropriate and possible. Otherwise, there's a shocking lack of social data available for answering these questions, a shocking lack. So, so one of our conclusions was, okay, it's shocking, so let's do better. Oh, so then anyway, that's, that's basically it in a, in a uh, nutshell. And I'm so open to you. <laughs> Bonnie, thank, thank you very much. I'll um, open the floor for clarifying questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with just our take, 
chair pri pri privilege. Bonnie, to what extent do you think the conclusions the committee reached depended specifically on the fisheries that you looked at, or, or do you think they are generally transferable? The conclusions, they are, well, they're intended to be um, both. Okay. <laughs> they're, I mean, obviously, we, we, did, we did emphasize quite often how important the specifics are of the design of a particular program, the design of the program and the history of that program. Yep. And that history is really important because you know that are you that explains who's involved and how and what what happened in the past, which affects so much what happens in the future, right. but also you know just in the fishery itself. So there is a history, and um, um, so that 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 I think is a kind of a, a number one thing that yes, these are there's some general generalizations about lap programs that um, that seem to be borne out on a broad scale here. But if you notice, there are very few where we have really good strong evidence for um, outcomes that you might expect um, for lap program. For example, um, the in economics, uh, a reduction of, of overcapacity. Yeah, maybe sometimes there was a reduction in overcapacity and other times if there was a reduction, it was because other things were going on. All right, so yep. so that's that's uh, basically good. Um, Rashid waited patiently at the last question session, so I'm going to give him first chance this this time. So, Rashid, uh, yeah, thank you very much, yeah, Bonnie. Thanks again for summarizing your report in such a short time. Right, it's not easy. Yeah, one thing you said that caught my attention. You said there was. Uh, Constant, there was consolidation, maybe I, I got it. Did you say there was consolidation, but you didn't see concentration of market power? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if that is the case, what, what is the reason? Usually, usually that is the issue, right? You have one person dropping everything. In, in BC, uh, the richest guy, Jim Patterson, is known to have gobbled up 90% of the herring quota, right? And so, Mm -hmm. So what, what was the secret here? How could you get consolidation, consolidation without, yeah, without market power? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I understand your question and I understand the concern here. Um, I, have to, I have to bow to my economist friends on the committee who have taken a very strict economic under, understanding of this and focused on the quota market. Now there are other kinds of market issues that you mm -hmm. might want to look at, but also these are very these in in all cases except the um, the golden tile fish of the mid Atlantic. I'd say um, these are very complex economic systems. So these lap fisheries are you know they're multi often they're multi-species uh, things going on. There are other factors that are in, in play. So there's not a simple, you know, herring situation and just herring alone and one, one, one clear market for it. There are different markets and so forth. So I'm, I'm kind of talking around this because um, I don't, you know, to, to an outsider, you'd say, oh my gosh, this is the problem. And, and we did, you know, the participants in the fishery saw this as a real serious problem. It, you know, mm. really cast in terms of the big guys taking over control. Yeah. But the problem is that we don't have good evidence for that, good economic evidence for it. Mm. Okay. okay. So yeah, yeah. Is, is it a real, you know, what it, the, there's a narrative here, but we don't have necessarily the data required to support that to narrative. Back it, to back it up, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was wondering whether there were limits to... The, the proportion of the share that one one entity can there there are entity. some limits of, okay. certainly imposed initially in the or mm -hmm. imposed after a while in the red snapper fishery because oh, of concern right. about that yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, so that um, could be that okay. there are, there are mm -hmm. different efforts in different fisheries to to control that to some degree but but that's a big question and so like in the red snapper case they actually did away with they did away with um, 
with a rule that you had to be um, that you had to be an insider. You couldn't you couldn't be an outsider to participate in it. You know, you had to be a fisherman. Fisherman. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They tried that one. They did away with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was an effort to try to say we don't want to have as they talked about it in, in older IATQ fisheries, the doctors and lawyers moving in and taking over. And taking over. Yeah. yeah, this is a frequent um you know you, you should talk to people in, in certainly in the northeast. They have that's mm -hmm. That's, Grant remembers that from our interviews, right? The, the doctors and lawyers taking over a fishery. Um, yeah. yeah, but when you commodify it, of course, you're opening it up to anybody yeah. coming in. And fishery is a good place to lose money if you want to lose money um, <laughs> for your tax returns or whatever. Uh, that, I cancel that. I didn't say that. Um, but yeah. All right. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. I get it. And the narrow definition could also be a player, right? Because economists yeah, have a that's way right. Of this is, it. Yeah. So and that's uh, that. I mean, that's one place where really getting together and and finding a way to work out a, a more effective discourse mm -hmm. among the participants in a committee is really important. Yes. Not to mention the participants in the actual deliberation in the councils. Mm. Thanks very much. So um, let's move on. Uh, Grant, you're next. Yeah, thanks, Bonnie. And actually, that was a nice segue. I think my question is sort of about community or uh, committee conduct and how you got to certain decisions that you appear to have made along the way. And as I understand from what you told us, there was a charge at the beginning for you to consider social, ecological, and economic effects of, of these things. And in a later slide, you showed us that you had the way I would describe it, disaggregated some of those effects into certain bins or categories of impact, and then talked about the strength of evidence within each of those, those bins. How did you do that? Which, that disaggregation and deciding to move beyond economic or within economic and, and think about labor force, for example, what was your process to do that? Did certain things just appear as being more important? Were you directed by your sponsor to do that? We came All up with an outline, an outline very early on. Um, and so in that outline, kind of controlled things for better or for worse. You know, I, I, there are other ways we could have done it, but we, we chose to have us different chapters that would look at the, the economic part and the eco ecological and social, you know, kind of ob obvious sort of thing. So we went with that that mentality, and um, and that may be, you know, that that arguably is not not the only alternative, and it's maybe not the best if you want to get a more interdisciplinary conversation going. It was efficient in the sense of deciding who's going to chat, who's going to write which chapters that kind of thing and that's that's a real problem you've got to have a way to you know to let the pe people who know the literatures and know the material the the discipline to to write um, using their expertise so it's uh i have to say though that we really even though we had we had disciplinary dis div divisions there we interacted an awful lot um, and argued about these things. Mm -hmm. And and nobody nobody jumped ship. <laughs> That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah. Deliberate. We deliberated about these things. We Bonnie. deliberated. <laughs> yes. We did. We did. It was very deliberative. Okay. Very and it was. It was very, it was very um it was it was very good. I mean, we really, I think we really came to know each other well in this way, even though we never had dinner together, never had a glass of beer together, nothing like that. But we managed to respect each other and learn to work together. Um, but I do think, I think your question is a really good one in terms of how do you, how do, you do this? And, and uh, you know, thinking, thinking outside of the usual boxes is worthwhile trying to do. Thanks. Thank you, Grant. Um, Stephen. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Bonnie, for that presentation. Uh, so one of the, the uh, probably consistent themes across your study and then lots of fishery social sciences is dealing with like data limitations or just data unavailability. And mm -hmm. I was curious if you all ran into uh, any consistent trends across the regions of uh, kind of response to that? Were there, were there you know, consistent stakeholder groups or agency responses that aligned with you know, support for collecting more data in either voluntary surveys or mandatory surveys? Or was there a general hesitance towards more types of programs like that or just any kind of experiences and thoughts okay. you might have on that? Sure. Well, the Gulf, the Gulf uh, Council and the Gulf region put a lot of effort into uh, developing ethnographic kinds of studies as well as social, you know, pretty careful social survey um, studies to complement what they were doing in other domains. So they put a, they put a lot of, of, of effort into it. Um, I think that, that that was outstanding. And so we have uh, David Griffith led a team that 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 really went out into different places and and really in, you know helped develop a very rich program. Um, the, uh, you know, I think the, the others, it varied, they have, where the, they're, they're, they did these lap reviews, these ITQ reviews, which are required by law. And, um, and they were of varying um, um, quality and, but in no, no other case in the Gulf did, it, did anybody actually do a, an independent study to try to, flesh out what was actually happening in the in these fisheries. It had been done for tuna, um, the tuna thing, but that's that's a big, huge, um, and that was done many years ago. In fact, um, we I did that. Um, and we did a we did a really interesting community study. But in all cases, these studies that come out of that effort are are difficult to argue for as major uh, as major sources of, of information because of this old problem. Well, okay, so you talk to um, a group of people or you had a focus group or something like that, but what do you really know? You know, did you does it re did it represent everybody? And and um, and you know, being aware that that um, there that, that this, it does matter to have, to have a very, very good broad representation. There's hesitancy in, in really pushing forth the kinds of, of uh, conclusions that are, that are pr provided by these studies. All right. Um, I mean, maybe we have to find, we'd have to find better ways of, of bringing them to bring, it's just the same thing if you're using the user, using indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, and so on and so forth. You know how, it's the same problem, but how do you bring this in, in a meaningful way that for people understand its value and, and how to use it without um, just challenging its, its, uh, its, its validity for what it is. Um, Stacy. Just two items that, Bonnie, maybe I can ask you to, to weigh in on too. Um, both your last comments triggered my thinking on both of these points. And the first is, you know, I recall one of the issues we had uh, specific to the Gulf was in trying to get um, information from fishery participants in particular, but other community members as well. Uh, that wasn't available in the data, you know, and trying to bring folks into our meeting, mm -hmm. we thought we had done, or I'll, I'll take, I thought I had done a pretty good job of, um, of understanding who needed to be engaged in those public session meetings and who needed to be at the table to have a robust discussion of some of these issues. And one thing I learned after the fact through some of these more informal conversations uh, with folks that had been in those open meetings is the people that are necessarily engaged or 
um, the people that are engaged with our open session meetings are not necessarily representative of the broader groups that they represent, mm -hmm. um, if that's, if I can say that right. And I don't know, Bonnie, if you had any other thoughts on that aspect too, but I, you know, I could imagine that being a challenge for this committee too. Mm -hmm. There is an inherent bias perhaps with people that are um, tracking our studies or willing to take, willing, available and, um, and, and have the luxury really of being able to take time out of their day to participate. Um, and so I think it's something this committee is going to have to think about too. One of the challenges we had was um, where the data is limited, getting any additional information from the public, from our open public sessions may be challenging for a variety of reasons. So that's one thing I'd love you to, to weigh in on, Bonnie. And then the other was my recollection, and it's hazy, I admit, um, but is with some of these laps, they've become so small that some of the data collection is really limited to because of the personally identifiable information um, concerns. And, and I'm, I'm hoping you can refresh my memory a little bit okay. about what some of those issues were that we ran into um, yeah. and whether or not we should anticipate those for this group as well. Yeah. Well, to the second, yes, the, the uh, group of three issue is, is an important one. Um, so I think we had for wreckfish, we, we were quite limited in what we could do in any kind of uh, quantitative way. We just, because the data were not available to us. And that's where, that's where the more ethnographic or journalistic approach is important. And then you do rely on the people who are willing to talk to you as well as the people who actually worked with the fisheries. Um, so that's, 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 a, that's a big problem, um, I think. I mean, I think it, it under, it's, it's a genuine problem where you have, um, like for a particular, if you're looking at communities, particular community has only one, one fish processing plant. What do you do? You can't even provide any, any information about what that's going on in that plant. Um, or if you have only three boats and you can't provide information about it. So there you have to use the more, um, the more, um, well, I'll say journalistic kind of information um, and ethnographic information to, to, you know, kind of supplement the fact that, or to compensate. And the, with, with regard to the first question, yeah, of course, the, um, the issue of participation in this, these kinds of open, um, I mean, as, as stakeholders, oh, I don't know that we, we, I hope we didn't, we didn't use the word stakeholder, I hope. But I mean, I don't that, think we. Uh, yeah. No, but, but I mean, but it does. It does tend to get people who have have an issue at hand, at, at and they want to talk about their issue, and which is fine, which is great. But of course, they're using the using the forum for their purposes, and um, and it is it. You did a great job, Stacy, in helping us reach out and 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 see what's out there, and get a pretty wide variety of. of of people involved, but we, we, we couldn't get everybody. And again, that's where it would be great to have somebody uh, advising uh, who does know the lay of the land, who does know who are the participants are. And I think you've, the people, the NOAA staff have been helpful in that regard. And the, um, you know, Sea Grant people could actually be used perhaps to greater effect to help with that too. I'm going to give the last question or, or clarifying comment to, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, he Hekia Bodwich. You've been very patient. Hi, thank you. Uh, that's great pronunciation. Uh, I'm Hekia. I'm a postdoc in marine affairs at Dalhousie, and I've been working with uh, Maori groups in New Zealand. Um, as well as First Nations in Atlantic Canada uh, on ways to use, uh, well, especially in New Zealand, ways to use quota to support uh, local fishing communities. And um, I'm curious uh, as to whether there's any initiatives under, underway in the U.S. to reverse or attempt to rework existing uh, ITQ or IFQ systems uh, to reallocate 
quota in ways that are more equitable. I'm just thinking about these indigenous reconciliation initiatives that have taken place, especially in New Zealand to allocate quota to Maori groups. And if there's any of, of those discussions underway in the US. Well, Alaska obviously is one place where there's this has been an issue. I'm, and um, the member of your committee from Alaska can probably speak to that pretty well. You know, one, one of the issues is, I think it was mentioned, I think Rashid brought it up in the, your earlier session that, um, you know, we're talking about um, indigenous groups, small scale groups and so forth. And we've got, a, we've got um, fishery, fishery systems that are, that are federal waters. And these programs are, the, these quota programs are in the federal fisheries and may or may not um, involve people who are fishing primarily in what we call state waters, state and territory waters, which are not federal waters. So it's like it becomes a whole other institutional apparatus that would be involved in that. And um, so then we have, you know, yes, it's a really big issue. And, um, and I don't know of any particular ones in the fisheries that I'm looking at right now that are doing that. But certainly there have been efforts, and except in, within commercial fisheries, there's smaller scale fisheries that have tried, as in Cape Cod, there was a group that long ago tried very hard to make sure that their members had access to the quota that they needed to participate. And even though they, so they had to buy up, create pools of quota that their members could then at, get, get access to. That kind of system is, has been used. Does that, does that sound like the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, this kind of broader question in general of, um, yeah. you know, we've seen exclusion happen. Um, sure. It's yeah. interesting that there's not evidence of consolidation, but yeah, so then, you know, when we redesign future systems or design future systems, you know, try to mitigating that from the start, but then yeah. what about the existing systems? Yeah, yeah. And so like features such as making sure that there are really tiny quotas that are available, tiny shares that are available, that's being done in some, some fishery, some programs. So that rather than, you, so that people, like a crew member could get a very small, like a half share, at least get a stake in the, stake in the fishery that way. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Bonnie, thank you as always for um, a really clear explanation and discussion of the issues that that um, your consensus committee faced. I, I think there are some broad parallels with some of the things we're going to yeah. have to explore. Absolutely, I, I'm somewhat jealous of your six case studies. I think that helps a little bit by putting a, a fence around. Um, what you're being asked. Um, I think appropriately Noah is asking us to think big first and then potentially come back and with a more case study based approach. Um, and uh, yeah, I've certainly benefited a lot from from reflecting on on the work that your co co committee did. So thank you very, very much for your time this afternoon. And um, good luck. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We're all waiting to see what you're going to do with this. Yes, yeah, so, so are we. <laughs> here's, a, here's a blank can, can, canvas. But don't um, hesitate. Don't hesitate to ask me or any other member of our committee to, you know, because we, we, we'd be happy to help out any way we can. Well, thank, thank you. We may welcome knocking. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very, very much once once again on behalf of all, all of the committee. Um, we're about four minutes ahead of time, which is a good place to be. We have a 15 minute break um, and we will return in closed session with a new Zoom um, conference address. It, it is on uh, today's agenda. Um, perhaps if uh, Eric or Leanne could email it out to everyone again so it's top of their list. Um, thank you, Eric, and uh, we'll see you all suitably ca caffeinated at 4.15 or quarter past whatever hour you, you, you have. Thank you. Bye-bye.